It was the reception after a local performance of Eight, the Lance Bass play about the Prop 8 marriage equality trial. I had played plaintiff Chris Perry. I hadn't talked to Serena since we'd broken up two weeks before. She walked up to me, plate of brownies in hand, and said, I didn't realize you were a lead. I nodded. Yeah. <laughs> you were really good. How long have you known the woman who played your wife? You guys were fabulous. A couple months, I said. We met in rehearsal. It looked like you guys were married in real life. That's how good it was. Thanks, I said, thinking, yeah, acting. <laughs> I mean, even in the Q&A, you were so well-spoken and everything. I'm just really impressed, Serena said, sounding confused. <laughs> Thanks, I said again, and then found my way to a group of cast members who were laughing near the kitchen. Serena remained standing in the middle of the room, holding a plate of brownies and a cup of coffee, looking lost. This woman dated me for three months. If she didn't know I was impressive or talented in that time, I promise it was not for lack of trying on my part. The last three ladies I dated, prior to Serena, all lived far away from me. I met them in what I tell people is my informal online writers group. That's technically true. But it'd be more honest to say they were strangers I met on the internet while writing gay erotic fiction about Harry Potter characters and Avengers characters. <laughs> I will say this for queer fan fiction ladies. When your hobby is gay erotica, Long-distance relationships can last quite a long time on the high caliber of sex we've grown accustomed to writing. I'll also say this. Having lovers in places like New Zealand and Wisconsin got me well acquainted with how to have sex using Skype, Haytel, WhatsApp, and even just your basic sexting. It didn't, however, allow me to regularly enjoy sexual practices such as touching or kissing. I was tired of the technical interface and the expensive plane tickets. I wanted a local lover. Okay, the problem is I live in Orange County. Not exactly a hotbed of lesbianism, it turns out. <laughs> Unless you're talking about fanny pack lesbians, because there are actual lesbians in Orange County that wear fanny packs. In the year of our Lord, 2015. <laughs> you can appreciate my problem. I needed someone who would get my geeky but feminist erotic fan fiction hopefully with some amazing tattoos, but also who was close enough for a booty call to result in real-life actual sex. That's when I met Serena. When the cute woman with long, wavy mermaid hair casually mentioned she'd seen Avengers three times in the theater, I was so excited that I called her my hashtag summer crush on my locked Twitter account and began courting her immediately. <laughs> Our first date was at a community production of Hedwig and the Angry Itch. It went so well, I invited her to have dinner at my house the next weekend, and she accepted. She told me she liked alcohol, but not beer or wine. Okay. So I looked up drinks involving a blender and blackberries that I deseated myself. She told me she was a vegetarian, so I made homemade pesto minestrone. I took steps not to overdo things. I wore jeans with my cute top instead of a skirt. I did not wear eyeliner. I left the grating of the Parmesan cheese for her to help with when she arrived so she could be part of the meal. Okay, the playlist featuring a lot of Florence and the Machine might have been overdoing it, but Serena was a psychology professor who went to a Unitarian church, liked Black Widow, and lived cl close enough for couch cuddling. Best foot forward and all that. I was a little disappointed when she arrived 30 minutes late wearing sweatpants. My first sign that maybe she wasn't as into me as I was into her but it could have just meant that she was comfortable showing me how she really felt. When I invited to help her to help grate the cheese, she said, oh, I, I don't really like grating cheese, but I'll help you with something else if you want. <laughs> she took her blackberry gin fizz and plopped down onto the couch. Okay, Serena might not have helped, but then I did improve from there. In some ways, it was your quintessential lesbian date. We talked about farm-to-table cuisine and CSA vegetable boxes. <laughs> but in other ways, it was unique to geek girls. We debated whether calling Kirk and Spock a bromance was a nod to their sexual attention or a cutesy erasure of their homoerotic chemistry. <laughs> she was more Star Trek geek than Harry Potter geek to my taste, but whatever. <laughs> Bakers can't be choosers. At the end of the night, I asked if I could kiss her. 
She said, okay, if you want. I continued to ask her out and she allowed me. I made out with her on my couch and she allowed me. One Friday at 5 p.m., she called and said, I'm thinking of going to a show tonight in Santa Monica. The silence spread between us until I said, would you like to go together? If you want. If you want was something she said to me a lot. Okay, Serena may have been lukewarm towards me romantically, but she kept enticing me with these conversations about feminism, queer life, and romance. I told her about my divorce, about coming out at 30, and she told me about biphobia that she received from the lesbian community when she dated a guy. I mean, these were conversations that I only ever had online. I really, really wanted my hashtag summer crush to work out. The night we actually slept together, we mainlined several episodes of her favorite TV show, Firefly. <laughs> it got late. We walked our dishes into the kitchen, and she turned to me and said, you can crash here if you want. <laughs> I said, are you inviting me to spend the night with you? She said, if you want. <laughs> well, I did want. I'd wanted her from the start. I slowly backed her up against the kitchen cabinets, giving her time to show me or tell me if this wasn't what she wanted. She wanted. We kissed down the hallway and took our time in her doorway to her bedroom because I learned from writing porn to value pressing against vertical surfaces as long as possible. <laughs> when we got to her bed, she moved towards the open window, stopped, and then made a small self-deprecating laugh. I had this boyfriend once who really hated it when I was loud, and so he always made me close the window before we had sex. I nodded, listening. Then I pulled her away from the open window, got my mouth under her jaw, and said, leave it. I was rewarded with her opening and coming apart underneath me. After she came and caught her breath, she said, so I don't know if you've ever heard of the term Pillow queen? I had not. <laughs> it's, it's what I am. I'm, I like sex, and thank you, by the way. But um, I don't really like to give it. I just, I'm more of a, uh, a taker, I supplied, hoping I didn't sound too judgmental. Exactly, she said. And it all kind of came together for me in that moment. This woman wouldn't grate cheese for a dinner I'd made her or dress up for me or say, I want your mouth on me. But she certainly enjoyed receiving all those things. Perhaps I should have walked out, but I was aroused and naked with my hashtag summer crush. <laughs> so I told Serena two important things I wanted done to my body and asked her how she felt about each of us taking one. She chewed her bottom lip, considering my request. That sounds kind of complicated. My face flooded with hot embarrassment. Well, yes, I said. Sex can be work, and it can be complicated, but I'll show you, and I think it'll be worth it if you want to participate. But it's up to you. She took a shaky breath, smiled, and said, okay. And maybe this was my favorite moment of the relationship. Serena, beautiful but uncertain. Me, patient gently guiding her through something she turned out to be very, very good at. <laughs> when we were done, she pushed my hair out of my face and kissed my forehead. That was really, really interesting, she said. <laughs> oh, I said, sounding curious. You were feeling all these things because of what I was doing. And then I began feeling them too, like they were happening to me, but they weren't. They were happening to you, like giving them to you, circuited them back to me. I'm not used to feeling that. Hmm, I said, reaching up to kiss her. She cuddled close to me and we slept the night pressed together. But a light breeze flowed in through the open window and by morning a chill had fallen around us. Over breakfast, Serena pulled her sweater tight over her shoulders and said in a voice she couldn't quite pull off as casual, 
I'm not sure sex is a big enough deal to me to do it like that all the time. You know, I'd rather watch Firefly, to be honest, if it's going to require work. Whatever ground we'd covered in the warm press of intimacy at midnight had evaporated by dawn. Maybe I should have known better, but I was devastated and embarrassed at how much I'd done for her and by how much I'd opened to her. So delighting in me and putting energy toward me at all didn't feel worth it to her? Well, why would it? I was putting enough energy in for the both of us. After that morning, I stopped calling her, and as you can imagine, that was more than enough to break us up. I didn't plan to talk to Serena after Ate the Play, but I felt vindicated by her compliments. She was seeing what she'd lost, perhaps for the first time. Yes, I was a lead. Yes, I was well-spoken in the Q&A. You dated me for a summer, and I de-seeded blackberries for you. I pulled you away from the open window, and I pressed my face to your body. Next time, pay some fucking attention. <laughs> After Serena moved away to her new job, she texted, asking if we could be friends on Facebook. To stay in touch, she wrote, I sat on it for a while, and then responded, if you want. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's Sarah Holtquist.